Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. It is a new year. Although with the Advent season, we began the, the new church calendar year. So it's kind of two new years. Today is also my baby brother's birthday, my parents' dog, Cody. He's 10. <coughs> Nothing else really going on in the Johnson family other than that, which is just fine. We are returning to the book of Hebrews, uh, which we left off uh, with six weeks ago. We haven't been in Hebrews for six weeks and four weeks of Advent. Then we had a, a Christmas uh, lesson last Sunday, which was Boxing Day. And now we're back in Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter six, just looking at a few verses. And Hebrews is coming back with a vengeance, because we have a really difficult passage. It's hard if you're doing the Greek, and I'm going to have to mention some Greek today, so let your father know we're doing some Greek down here. And uh, But it, it's even in English, it's not an easy passage. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. I'm going to break that up into three um, sections. Just to kind of get us, I'm not going to go over what we've done in the previous five chapters and three verses, but the, the last lesson that we dealt with before we broke off for Advent had to do with pressing on to maturity. And there's a connection between those first three verses of chapter 6 and the passage that we're dealing with now. You, there is clearly a topical break between verses 3 and 4, but for the most part, um, there is continuity as well. And if you remember... I think we did, we uh, began in verse 11 of chapter 5 and went through 6-3. Uh, the main thrust of that was to press on to maturity. You've, you've laid a foundation of your Christian faith. You've uh, gone over those um, elementary principles. That's one of the uh, translations of a, a Greek term, or elementary teachings. You got the basics, so press on, because you can't stay in the, the basics. You can't just stay in the fundamentals. You've got to continue to grow and mature and develop. And even though there is a bit of a topic change, there is a clear connection between those three verses at the beginning of chapter 6 and the verses we're going to look at today, 4 through 12. Um, although uh, a lot of folk, a lot of commentators think that there's a, an overwhelmingly clear break between um, 3 and 4, I, I don't think it is. There is a connection. So six weeks ago, we looked at a passage in which the, the key topic or idea was to press on to maturity. You're not growing in the Lord, the, the, uh, the author is telling this congregation. You're still dealing with the basics, with the fundamentals, and you can't keep doing that. You've got to grow and mature in your walk in the Lord. And then we get to verse 6. When we, we're going to read verses 4 through 6, before we do, before you start perusing through it, and I'll ask this question again whenever we read these three verses. But as we look at verses 4 through 6, without bringing any preconceived notions, any ideas that you may have in, in regard to your own personal understanding or your understanding as a, a Baptist or an Evangelical or Protestant, however you want to term yourself, simply listen to this passage, pay attention to what it's saying, and without thinking too much about it, um, what do you think the author is saying in verses 4 through 6? So could somebody read verses 4 through 6? Of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. That's the New American Standard Version? Because that's what I have. Okay. Does someone have something other than the New American Standard Bible and would be willing to read verses 4 through 6? So we can hear it again in a different way. I'll read. Excellent. I've got the NIV. Perfect. It says, it is impossible 
for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their laws, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Okay, once again, without any preconceived notions, just simply reading that passage, what does it sound like the author is saying here? What is he telling us? You can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. What else? Mike, I, I'm not disagreeing, but anything else that, that sounds like is going on here? I'm shaming God. Okay. Anything else? This is not an easy passage. And it sounds like on an initial reading. It kind of sounds like this in the Greek as well. So the English isn't that far removed. And uh, although I do like, for if you have the NIV, you like the way the NIV sticks that little phrase, which in my translation, Tim's translation, it is impossible, which is in verse 6. In the Greek, it's actually in verse 4. For it is impossible, and then it goes on. That's really the way it's phrased, and that's an important uh, phrase. It's actually one word in the Greek. But it sounds like you can fall away, that you can leave the faith. And once you have, as it says in verse 6, you can't renew yourself to repentance. Just like you can't re-crucify Christ, you can't put him to shame. In case you're wondering, what's that whole thing about can't put him to shame again? He is victorious. He's been raised from the dead. He's been elevated above the heavenlies. He is Lord over all creation. He's been uh, granted uh, because of his obedience, his death, burial, and resurrection. The Father has... Uh, elevated him to a position of ultimate victory, so he can't be shamed anymore. That's that's where that shame thing comes in. Going against God, it's impossible to be come back, or is that you know, like the act? The active, act, the act of being involved in walking away, you can't have it two ways at the same time. Is that a question? Yeah, do you think that's what it could also mean? Do, do you think that's what it could mean? Well, it seems like there's no hope of that for you to ever repent, you know, because we all do that you know, from time to time, then how can we be saved? Where does grace come and that happens to be the case? I'm wondering. If once you're actively involved uh, doing the opposite, you can't be actively involved doing what God wants you to do. That's a good point. Is, is that what it sounds like? That you got one chance at it, and once you step away, you can't come back, so there is no hope? Does it sound hopeless? comes down to your interpretation of, in our version, falling away. What does that mean? And that's usually what most people focus on, that whole thing about falling away, which we've kind of seen before. Um, it was drifting away. You don't have to turn there, but if you remember back in chapter 3, verse 12, uh, well, no, the, it, at this point it does say fall away. Take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you uh, of you an evil unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God he seems he, he doesn't clearly state uh, I look out of the congregation I see that some of you have fallen away he said be careful in case some of you are falling away um, and and I can't remember the verse now but he, he talks about drifting away um, we looked at that as well uh, and uh, remember when we were looking at that verse some didn't necessarily like the notion of drifting away don't like that whole falling away thing um, especially when you start, because it, in the two times he's talked about drifting away and falling away, it's usually just been a warning, be careful that you don't do that. But here it sounds like, be careful, if you do that, you can't come back. When you go out that door, you cannot come back in, it locks behind you. 
That's kind of what it sounds like it's saying. And, and that's where the issues have come up for the last 2,000 years. That's where all sorts of Greek and Latin church fathers and scholars and uh, theologians and commentators have been hashing out what in the world is this man saying here? Because it's been interpreted in a lot of different ways. And, and typically what it does sound like is um, you can fall away, you can lose your faith. You can, as the Methodists say, you can fall from grace. And once you fall from grace, some say you can come back, some say you can't come back. It all depends, usually, upon your theological construct. Um, what is it that we Baptists say about salvation? What's a little phrase we often use? Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. When God has you in his hand, no one can open it up and pull him away, pull you away from him. Um, I always thought it was interesting in that uh, image that we typically use. Uh, it, it's usually connected with uh, uh, Satan or some type of other uh, force outside of God. They, in other words, nothing is powerful enough to pull open God's hand and remove you from salvation. But that's not what the author seems to be saying here. He seems to be saying you can walk away. In other words, you can press open God's fingers and, and say, bye, gone, out of here, I'm done. Um, so it, it, if it sounds a little confusing, even hopeless, you, you're not alone. Others have thought the same thing, that there is no hope. Uh, there are multiple interpretations of this. I'm just going to mention, uh, what is it, six of them, which most are, are it kind of sounds like it is familiar with. Um, and some of you may have this term as a chapter heading or a section heading in the Bible. The apostasy view. In other words, no one can be readmitted once you have lapsed in your faith. When you've left the faith, you have one chance of coming in. And once you have repented and then you decide to unrepent and no longer believe, then you can't come back. Um, we're in chapter 6 of Hebrews. We're back to Hebrews, Naomi. Hebrews 6, 4 through 12. So the apostasy view is, and this one comes up, there's a church father named Tertullian. If you need to know the details of who he is, ask Dr. Spivey. You'll get an earful. He'll tell you everything about Tertullian you want to know. But Tertullian is one of the first to advocate the idea of the lapsed, those that have lapsed in their faith, because he was dealing with a real-time church historical situation in which real persecution was starting to hit the church. And uh, there were those Christians who left the church in order to escape the persecution. The persecution was over with, and then they decided to come back. And Tertullian and, and others would say, no, nope, can't do that. And part of the basis of their argument of not being able to come back, being lapsed in your faith, is this passage. So you've got one chance and one chance only. There's the Reformed view, uh, where in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. There's the Reformed view, the non-elect Reformed, that's Calvinists and, and others. The non-elect have tasted, uh, and because the verb tasted is in there, have tasted but not consumed the faith. They bear Christian characteristics, but they are not truly saved. Sometimes I, I hear that among Baptists. I don't, I don't think um, there are those that necessarily are advocating it because they are Calvinists or they are Reformed, but it is that idea that, well, if somebody falls away, they were never really saved. And uh, those who are part of the Reformed tradition would say, well, they, they fell away because they were part of the non-elect. They were not elected for salvation. Well, what, it's, what I see here in the ESV, have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. which sounds like more than tasting. And sounds like consuming to me. Yeah. And biblically, when the verb tasted is used, Jesus will use that verb, Paul will. It has to do with, it's not just like a little bit of a taste of it, um, but I'm not going to actually ingest it and take it into my life. Um, when you have tasted of heaven, you have experienced heaven. When you have tasted of salvation, you have ingested it and you've consumed it. So that one doesn't, that doesn't really fly also. And that's part of the problem with the Reformed view. There's the majority view, conversion was insincere, they were never really saved. Well, the reason why somebody falls away is because they were never really committed in their following of Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, that's why they fell away. If they'd really been saved, then they would not have fallen away. They wouldn't have left the church. There's the chastening view. This one's really unusual. Salvation is not lost. In other words, you're not going to lose your salvation and go to hell, but one's rewards have been lost. You've achieved salvation, but the rewards that come with salvation are no longer a part of the salvation process. In other words, you'll get to heaven, I guess, and it'll be real boring. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, and the, the two commentaries that I read through, when they mentioned the chastening view, didn't give details. And as I, always when I deal with commentaries, the question that I want most answered is the one that they never answer. I wanted to hear more and more about the chastening view. What exactly did they mean by it? That you don't lose your salvation, but you lose your reward of salvation? I thought salvation was the reward, I guess, anyway. There's the community view that apostasy, falling away, only applies to this specific congregation that the author is writing to and not to other churches at large 2,000 years ago or to us today. That one's kind of dodgy because you could apply that to a lot of other passages and read through it and say, well, since it applied to them 2,000 years ago, it doesn't apply to us. Um, so that gets a little problematic. And then the last one, is probably the one that is most confusing. It's the one that so far I've only come across two individuals um, who have advocated it. One of them, unfortunately for you, is one of my Greek professors over at Southwestern, Bruce Corley. The other one is H.E. Dana. H.E. Dana was a mid 20th century Greek professor at Southwestern who went off to be um, president of Central Baptist Theological Seminary up in Kansas City, Kansas. Those are the only two individuals that have I've come across that have expressed a hypothetical view. And you, you have to pay attention to the Greek at this point. Without going into too much detail, uh, that phrase in, in most of us, that most of us have in verse 6, it is impossible, is actually where um, Winnie's translation had, had it at the beginning of verse 4. It is impossible for all of this stuff to take place. This is what's known, and this is the only... Uh, example of this in the New Testament, and it kind of lends itself toward the type of uh, Greek that the author of Hebrews uses, which is uh, the most complex, most literary uh, form of Greek in the New Testament. It's hard stuff. I took uh, Dr. Corley's uh, Hebrew class, or Hebrews class. We went through the book of Hebrews, and uh, I, you know, I'd had my two years of Greek, and I would have my English and my Greek and I spent more time in the English than the Greek because the Greek is, is hard stuff. But this is supposed to be a second-class conditional sentence, a statement contrary to fact. Don't let that scare you because you're probably familiar with at least one example of a second-class conditional sentence. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke chapter 7, verse 39, Jesus is in the home of one of the Pharisees, and um, a woman suddenly rushes in, falls at his feet, and starts kissing his feet and, and crying on his feet and wiping her tears with her hair at his feet. And the Pharisee, in whom uh, Jesus is in his home, says in a second-class conditional sentence, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, quote, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this person is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. What he is saying is the exact opposite. If this man were a prophet, and he's not, he would know what kind of woman this is, and he doesn't. In other words, he's saying one thing, literally, but he's stating something, he's stating the exact opposite. This man is no prophet because he doesn't have a clue what type of immoral woman is groveling at his feet. So he's making a statement contrary to fact. It seems like that's what, if you... Um, aspire to this hypothetical view what the author seems to be saying. And the reason why I'm hammering home on this is because I've been convinced by Dr. Corley that this is probably what's going on. Probably what's going on. He's making a statement contrary to fact. Basically what he's stating is the opposite. You can't put Jesus to shame. To shame. You can't re-crucify him. You can't repent. You can't re-repent. You can't go back over all of this stuff again and you can't fall away because the ultimate point is you have one choice of one choice only wherever you are. And we've already seen that back in verse 1. Press on. That's really what he's saying. 
What he seems to be telling this congregation by stating the opposite is, you can't redo all this stuff, right? We can't re-crucify Christ. You can't re-repent. You can't re-lay, you can't lay down again the, the foundations of your faith. So you have one choice, move forward, press on. That's the real point behind this passage. Um, it, it's not really addressing falling away, which is what we always want to focus in on, which is fine. And, and I'll bring that up at the end of uh, the lesson because I do want to uh, mention that because falling away is something that does come up. But he did, the, the falling away doesn't seem to be the real focus at this point. What it seems to be the real focus is warning uh, this congregation once again, don't relay the foundations of your faith because you've already done that. And the reason why he doesn't want them to do that again is because you can't go over all of that process. So you can't re-repent. So he's stating the exact opposite. He's stating the exact opposite by stating one thing. He's telling them one thing by trying to tell them the exact opposite, which is ultimately move forward. Don't pull back in your faith. Continue to move forward. In other words, you can't fault it. For this congregation, you can't go back into Judaism. You all were Jews before and you were faithful to Moses and the law, but now you are committed and faithful to Jesus Christ. Be faithful and committed to him. And quit trying to relay your faith. Your faith. Quit thinking that you can fall away. Quit thinking that you can re-repent because you can't do those things any more than you can re-crucify Christ. So, move forward. Press on in, in your full commitment to Jesus Christ. It seems like that's what he's saying. That sounds to me like making the word say what you want it to say. Now, having said that, all of the other interpretations are either are or seem to be in conflict with a number of verses of Scripture. So maybe it is the best translation. I think it is, but it's hard to get to this point, uh, and and I would agree. And it's part of the reason why, it, and it's just little old me. Uh, there's nothing. Don't walk away thinking, well, I have to agree with Charles because he's teaching the class. You don't have to agree with me. I tell my students at DBU and TCC this, and they they seem shocked by that. Uh, you know, it, you can disagree with me, and that's more than okay. Because first of all, this is not an easy passage, whether you're doing the Greek or you're doing the English. And secondly, if some of you want to say now, in full disagreement, that it's something else, you might be right. Do we have to pick one? You don't have to pick one. You can pick none of the above. Just don't fall into that trap of, can we avoid this altogether? Uh, that's that's probably the most dangerous position to have at all. Or, as the young folks say, whatever. Can we move on to verse 7, please? Well, that's not going to help you because verses 7 and 8 are kind of an exposition or an ex explanation of verses 4 through 6. Um, oh, so that's the answer in the next two verses? It is, and wait till you read that answer. <laughs> it may not help you. Don't get ahead of me, though. Don't start looking at 7 and 8. I know you already are. But um, if you disagree with the hypothetical view, that's fine. If you think once saved, always saved, you can't fall away, that's fine. Um, if you want to do the reform view, well, I think only the elect uh, can not fall away. Those who do fall away are not elect for salvation. That's fine, too. If you're a good part of Calvinist, more power to you. These are not things that are ultimately should not, no, let me rephrase that. These are things that ultimately should not divide us. Um, and I think we can, at least, if you can't agree with the way that I've gotten to the point, I think we can all agree with, I think, what seems to be the author's main point, which is press on. He wants this congregation moving forward, and they seem to be drifting back. We've dealt with that before. That theme has come up more than one time. Move forward, please. He's telling them, move forward in your faith. Grow, mature, develop in Jesus Christ. Because you can't linger where you're at, and you certainly can't drift back. That's dangerous. So move on. Press on in your maturity. Um, however you get to that conclusion, I think it will be fine. If you can get to that conclusion, 
I don't think any of us would disagree with it. I don't think anybody would raise their hand and say, shouldn't we drift back and become immature in our faith and, and wander and kind of make it up as we go? I think we can all at least get to that point of um, embracing the idea that we should press on. I, I think, you know, wasn't he talking to the Hebrew congregation because they were going wanting to go back to Judaism? Mm -hmm. Maybe he's being that drastic because the most, because of what they want to do is extremely drastic. There's no way to mix the two old wine skins. I, I, so I think yeah. maybe if you read it in that context, maybe that's why he's being so harsh. But it's, I guess, it could be true for us as well. But you can't live the old life. I think you're absolutely right. I think he's trying to shock them. I think he's trying to basically uh, jerk them up uh, by the nape of the neck and say, look folks, you can't go back. It's dangerous. It's eternally dangerous. And, and part of it goes to um, a, a word that we'll get to here in a moment whenever he refers to them. He cares desperately about this congregation so desperately that he's willing to record a sermon that he's preached, put it in the form of a letter and send it to them and say, read this please, because this addresses what's going on in your congregation and I'm scared for you because I care about you and I love you and I want you to be mature in your walk in Christ. This person genuinely cares about this congregation. And so rather than just soft soap it and try to ease them into it, he wants to pull them up short and say, you can't do this, so stop it and move forward. It goes toward his concern and toward his love. Um, every once in a while I hear Dr. Spivey do that with us. Not necessarily to the same extent, but he says things sometimes that are pretty hard to hear, to be perfectly honest. And you know what? Sometimes we might need to hear them. I think this congregation needed to hear this. You can't re-crucify Christ, can you? The congregation would say no. You can't repent again, can you, if you can't re-crucify Christ? Then quit trying to do it and move forward in your faith. Some of those um, phrases that are used in verses 4 and 5 that talk about the Christian characteristics have been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift. Um, I, I just wanted to go over those quickly. Those have been interpreted in a lot of different ways. But that phrase, been enlightened, it's often been interpreted as baptism. It probably isn't. It probably has something to do with a one-time experience that can't be repeated. It's unrepeatable. I don't know if that's an English word, but it is now. Um, you can't repeat whatever it is that you've done. And if you want to say that's baptism, that's fine. Uh, but it probably has to do with something more than that. It's probably the initial conversion experience that you, you've been enlightened one time. And once you've done that, you can't be enlightened again. I, I think another way of saying it is you've encountered Christ for the first time in your life. You can't encounter him for the first time again. It's not the first time. Um, and then tasted the heavenly gift. Uh, we, we focus on that tasted, and a lot of people have said, well, that's the Lord's Supper, that's the Eucharist. No, it probably isn't that. It probably means um, uh, something along the lines of the spiritual blessings that we have received, because it is connected to the Holy Spirit. And, and as uh, Alan brought up, it's tasted is not, well, I've got a taste of it, but I haven't fully ingested it. When you've tasted it, when you've experienced, when you've tasted the spiritual blessings, you've experienced them, you've taken them into your life, you know what it means to be blessed of God. You know what it means to be conjoined to Him in a living relationship through Jesus Christ. You have become a Christian. You're not sort of dancing on the edge of Christianity. I guess it's a Baptist church, I shouldn't say dance. Um, you, you're not just on the perimeter of it. You are fully committed. You've been enlightened and you have fully ingested it. And then partakers of the Holy Spirit, partakers of word that the author of Hebrews has used before, means a companion you're conjoined to. It doesn't have to do with spiritual gifts. It doesn't even have to do with the work of the Spirit. It has to do with the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individuals themselves and the life of the congregation. The Holy Spirit is right there in your lives, indwelling in you. You've got the Spirit, and your congregation has the Spirit. And then that last long phrase, goodness of God's word and the powers of the age to come, that first phrase probably has to do with uh, the word of God, the 
lowercase w word of God that is the scriptures, you've, uh, and for them that would be the Old Testament, for us the Old and the New Testament, you've encountered those things and that interpretation of the scriptures in regard to who Jesus Christ is, or it could be simply the capital W word of God, Jesus himself. You got Jesus, or you have the, the scriptures. And then that last phrase, the powers of the age to come, those are likely the signs of the future kingdom to come itself, uh, which reminded me of a phrase in Matthew 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus used that phrase more than one time, and that was his way of saying the kingdom of heaven is not just way out there beyond you or in the next life. It's here. It's now. It's available. It's close by. And it's. And I think one of the points that Jesus was trying to make is that it's closer than you think. So the powers of the age to come are not just something in the future, but it's the powers that we encounter now. Uh, the power of spiritual blessing, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that we receive as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he simply ends this part of the, the, the verses by stating you can't redo this. And since you can't redo it, go forward. Move forward in your faith. Could somebody read verses 7 and 8? Unless you have another question or statement. Alan kind of looks like he does, but he's afraid to ask him. No, no, no. <laughs> but if someone could read 7 and 8. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to be a curse whose end is to be burned. All of a sudden, we start talking about agriculture, and land, and crops, and things like that. Um, and, and it's a, a strange thing, suddenly, because we've been talking about falling away, and repentance, and re-crucifying Christ, and once you've experienced all these things, can you do them, can you not do them, can you fall away, can you not fall away? If you do fall away, can you? And then the author of Hebrews starts talking about farming. <clears throat> the point of these two verses seems to be an exposition of the previous, not just three verses, but perhaps six verses, and that exposition or explanation, that expansion of it is essentially there are two paths that you have at this point, where he's telling the congregation, wherever you are at, drifting back, falling away, um, or sort of in um, a holding pattern, wherever you are at, you need to understand, congregation, there are two paths, and one of those paths is like verse 7, water that drink or the land that drinks the the rain and uh, yields brings forth vegetation has been blessed of God and the one that doesn't drink it in doesn't drink in the water it yields thorns and thistles it's worthless it's um, it is close to being cursed or it is on the verge of being cursed it's burned up and goes away it, what it seems to be stating is that now that you know you can't re-repent, now that you know you can't re-crucify Christ, now that you know you can't undo these things, in your falling away you have only one choice, to move forward into one path, verse 7, or you will continue on the second path, verse 8. Those are your only choices in life, ultimately. Um, now a lot of folks say, that's not really what verses 7 and 8 are all about. I think it is. Because it's just strange that suddenly he's, he's getting into this complex Greek and this difficult theological statements, and then he starts talking about agriculture. That usually means there's some sort of imagery that he's trying to convey here, and I believe that's what he's trying to do. What's confusing to me um, in verse 8 is when he says, it is worthless and close to being cursed. I don't know why he didn't just say worthless and cursed, but there's a little Greek word in there, incus, which means close to or nearby or on the verge of. And I think what he's saying is that the that land that is not drinking in the rain, that is becoming worthless, is close to being cursed. And when you're cursed, you have been expelled and cast away from God. It's kind of like the parable of the talents, the, those coins that Jesus talks about, where the, the one servant who received his one coin buried in the ground was determined to be worthless. He was cast out. Suddenly the, the parable turns eschatological, 
In other words, Jesus is saying that third servant was useless and pointless and was damned to hell. I think that's what the author of Hebrews is saying, is that if you continue on that path, you will be on the verge of being cursed and cast into hell, forever departing away from the spiritual blessings and the relationship from God that he wants this congregation to have. That's the best way I can understand that little phrase of close to or nearby or on the verge of cursed. I think he still sees hope in this. Maybe, maybe not. Any disagreement questions about 7 and 8? I didn't really want to hammer this one home because I think he's just kind of laying out that simple point. If there's two paths, pick one. Because you've got to do that. You can't waver. I keep thinking about the parable of the good and bad soil. Yeah, me too. And because, you know, when you are to that point that he's in verse 8, you know, you may not have control over whether or not you become hopelessly forgotten by God and cursed. You know. But the importance is to uh, seven is that he is the good earth. So he's reading and trying to learn. It's not like a professor necessarily or a professional teacher or whatever, but by the average person who wants to really change the soil they walk in. You know. And uh, as opposed to someone who is is so far gone because they've not ever tried to change. Mm -hmm. You are not alone. You're not the first ones to think of that. Uh, the parable of the soils, uh, the one that Jesus tells where the farmers cast down the seed and some fall on good soil, some fall on what seems to be good soil and they come up, but, but then the sun comes along and burns them up and some fall into the, the rocky soil where they never really take root. Um, this is a little bit more stripped down version of that, but it, it seems to be the same type of imagery. Somebody's all talking about the Holy Spirit. It very well be as well. I mean, because going back to four, it's like a uh, case of have been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made. The heavenly gift is the Holy Spirit. Because once you've been saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on seven and eight, it's like you've heard the word, but you haven't accepted it. Or you did. In verse 7, you have the Holy Spirit. 8, you don't have the Holy Spirit, but you're not cursed because you've heard the word, you just haven't accepted it yet. So there's your hope. Mm -hmm. So it all comes down to have you accepted the Holy Spirit? Or have you, have you received the Holy Spirit? Uh, it may very well be that also. Um, I think that's a good point. I think you're making an excellent point. We've seen, uh, You can see that elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, Paul and others will come along and ask, uh, I know you've heard of Jesus and you've heard of John the Baptist, but have you heard? Uh, but have you received the Holy Spirit? And when they haven't, they'll lay hands on them and they will receive the Holy Spirit, as if that first part of their salvation is made full and complete. Um, and it, that may uh, that may be a very clear connection between four through six and seven and eight. Um, but I think at the end of the day, verse uh, even in verse eight, there's still a little hope that the author holds out. You're close to being cursed, but not yet. It's near. You're on the verge of it. Don't tip all the way into. Now, he never clearly says, in case you're wanting to, what's the definitive Hebrew of author's position on falling away? He doesn't make it. He doesn't expressly state, you can or you cannot. Or if you do, you can come back or you can't. He never says that. What he says is stop drifting, stop falling, come back, move forward. That seems to be his big concern. What he would tell his congregation is, uh, you originally were faithful to Moses and to uh, the law. Now you're faithful to Christ, but some of you seem to be leaving Christ and going back to Moses. Stop it and come back and go forward. Could somebody read verses 9 through 12? But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget the work and the love which you have shown toward his name, in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, 
so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. The author now turns to a word of encouragement, uh, which is, I think, what he ultimately wants to get to. He's warned them in a very almost shocking way. Well, it was a shocking way. He's warned them because he's so concerned, and you can hear that concern coming out in verse 4. It's the only time he uses the word beloved, agape toy. About six, seven, eight weeks ago, Dr. Spivey brought up that word beloved. This is the only time he calls them beloved. He loves this congregation. So he's warned them, but now he's encouraging them. I think God has better things for you. Um, and he doesn't clearly state exactly what those better things are. Um, but he is showing a genuine concern for them. And uh, that idea of better is something that comes up time and time and time again in the, the book of Hebrews. I refer to it as the ameliorative gospel. Ameliorative is just a fancy way of saying making something better than. You got Moses, we got something better. You have the high priest, we have a heavenly high priest. Um, you, you have a sacrifice in the temple, we have an ultimate set. There's always something better with Jesus Christ. Well, he may be encapsulating all those things of what it means to follow Jesus Christ in that little phrase, better things. So he doesn't exactly state what it is. Uh, you can probably fill in the blanks however you, want, however you so choose. It may be better than falling away. It may be better in, in the, the life to come. Whatever it is, you stick with Christ, it's going to be better than anything you could have had in your former life. Whatever that may be. And then that, that phrase of uh, matters relating to salvation or things that accompany salvation, it, I think it's just a general term. We're talking about salvation here, congregation, therefore, in regard to those, uh, into regard to those better things, into the matters of salvation, um, that's what I'm most concerned with. More than falling away, more than drifting back, it's the things that are much more important. That's why he doesn't hammer them as much, and he gets to this point of encouragement and in hope that they have. Um, and that little phrase at the end of verse 9, though we are speaking in this way, and that just he's telling them, though I'm speaking in a way that sounds really harsh and scary, and, and I'm warning you about the peril of drifting and falling away, that's not ultimately what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is the moving forward, the pressing on toward maturity. That seems to be the, the, the key phrase. Um, and convinced, the verb convinced that he uses there of better things, uh, it has to do with, um, uh, where I just suddenly lost it, uh, the eagerness, or no, no, that's not the right one. Um, it, it has to do with a strong or an absolute convic convic conviction. I am fully convinced, I am fully and absolutely uh, embracing this conviction that there are better things for you. In, in other words, he's not making this phrase in passing. Uh, you know, you're drifting, folks, stop it. You know, there may be better things, I don't know. No, he knows. And he's fully committed to the idea that Christ has better things for this congregation. So, embrace Christ. Move forward in that. Then in verse 10, the, the author declares that God will remember their both past and present works among believers, those fruits of righteousness that flow from their relationship with God. He's not talking about works of salvation. In, a, in other words, it's not working toward one's salvation or achieving one's salvation, but the things that result from one's salvation. God sees them in what God recognize, recognizes as those works that you're doing among believers. You're doing those works ultimately on behalf of God and to God. When you are... When you are demonstrating your faith, when it is an act of faith on behalf of believers, God sees that, knows it, and recognizes it as doing something to him. So when it's kind of like what Christ said, when you did these things unto the least of them, you did them unto me. So when you help somebody, you're helping God. When you love somebody, you're loving God. When you take care of someone, you're caring for God. God feels and knows these things, so they're important, he's He's telling the congregation. It's not just a nicety. It's not just a warm feeling. Would it be improper to call them works of sanctification? No, I don't think so. Because they come with that process of sanctification. Uh, I think the author of uh, the book of James, I think James would say, let's see your salvation in action. Otherwise, you're just standing up in front of the congregation and saying, I am saved. 
And that's all I have to show, is to tell you that I've been saved. And that's good, and that's a starting point. But our salvation should re result in, in action. Love is an active verb. You don't just feel love. You don't just know it. You see it. When you demonstrate love for your children, love for your spouse, love for your friends, love for fellow believers, they see it. They know it. They feel it. It's demonstrated. It's active. Um, it, it's not the thing that uh, is love, but it's the result of it. Well, it, I, think, uh, I think your phrasing is very apt. It's, these are the works, not of salvation, but the works of sanctification what comes of that relationship. And then in verse 7, the author is concerned with the same diligence. And that word diligence means effort or eagerness or meaningfully engaged in something. And what he's telling them is, you were excited and zealous in your commitment to Jesus Christ when you first came to him. Try to carry that over in your walk in Christ, in your faith journey. You should have the same level of commitment and excitement, enthusiasm, and dedication. Now, you can't always sustain it, I realize that. Uh, it, it, but there needs to be that same type of meaningfulness and, and engagement in your walk in Christ at this point because the congregation seems to be lagging. They seem to be drifting. And he's trying to encourage them to get back to that uh, same level of eagerness and commitment, diligence that they had before. In other words, uh, they are to persevere, to press on. And then in verse 12, the author exhorts the congregation to imitate the women and men of faith who came before them, which, getting a little bit ahead of myself, anticipates chapter 11. It's that litany of the faithful that he will, the author will go through. By faith, so-and-so. By faith, so-and-so. By faith, all these uh, heroes of the faith from the Old Testament uh, demonstrated and committed their faith. Be like them. Now, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but he's, he's, he's uh, sort of anticipating that, where he's going to talk about the specific examples. Well, they know those specific examples, Moses, Abraham, David, Isaiah, etc., etc. Be like them. If you need an example, you have examples, congregation, just like we have examples from the Old Testament. We have examples from the New Testament. We have examples of people in our own lives, people of faith, women and men of faith that we have seen and known. And those of you who ever knew him, the, the person that always comes to mind is Dr. Jack Gray, who has gone to be with the Lord, but was a tremendous example of faithfulness and prayer. Um, if you get into a conversation with Dr. Spivey about Dr. Gray, he'll tell you he was the hardest professor I ever had, but what a godly man of prayer. I've heard other students of Dr. Gray say the same thing. Hardest professor I ever had, but what a godly man of prayer. Um, so we have examples of faithful individuals that we should follow. And the, the author is telling them, cling to those examples, press on, um, and, and don't fall into sluggishness or lethargy or indifference, but imitate the faithful and press on, persevere in your full commitment and your full diligence of following Jesus Christ. Any questions about this passage or any of the phrasing or ideas? Because I, I wanted to wrap up with a couple of questions before we depart. But I didn't want to leave anything lingering. Now, how we interpret it and how we interpret the individuals that might drift away and fall away that's not really my concern. As a matter of fact, I think ultimately we, there's a couple of questions we can't ask. Can someone leave the faith? Because we, when we ask that question, we don't really draw an ultimate conclusion. We draw uh, several interpretations. No, you can't. Yes, you can. And then that, the other question is, if someone can leave the faith, uh, what happens to them? Can they come back? Well, some say yes, some say no. I think we can all agree that there are those who do whatever their status is, because ultimately they're, they're um, only God knows their spiritual condition. But there are those that leave the faith, and there are those that leave the church. We've known people, I've known people, I assume that you do, I've known people that disappear, don't hear from them, they don't join another congregation, they just leave. 
Um, and I have heard of and know of individuals that have left the faith as well. And, and typically, not always, but most of the time when somebody leaves, they do drift. I think that's a good word that the author of Hebrews uses. Drifting means you just, you're on the water, and you slowly start to drift away, and then pretty soon nobody really knows them. They move to the back of the room, quit coming. You don't see them frequently in Sunday morning in the congregation, in the morning worship, and then the next thing you know, it's three, four, five, six months later, and you ask, well, where's so-and-so? And nobody knows. People usually drift. Nobody, in my experience, although I'm sure it's happened, has ever stood up in front of a congregation and said, I renounce my faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm leaving the church, I'm leaving Christianity, it's a lie, and walk out. They usually kind of drift. But my question is, what do we do? And I think it's an important, however you view those individuals and they're drifting and they're falling away, what do we do for those individuals that do drift and fall away? If you know your comfort zone, sometimes they just ask, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes, but it's really, you have to start somewhere, you know, and it's, um, probably not exactly what to do, you know, you don't know why they left, you don't know what their issue is, but you can only ask. And... I think that's a good point. Uh, I think you're making two good points. We should ask, and it's not always easy to approach somebody and ask, however you do that, you know, and that's part of the issue as well. I think it's hard to ask, so how come you, I don't see you in church anymore? That's not necessarily an easy thing to open up. It's not an easy conversation to begin. But I think it's a necessary one. If we, if we refer to those individuals as beloved, if they really are beloved, and, and we are concerned about them as much as the author of Hebrews is about his congregation, we need to ask. I, I just think it's such an important thing. We've been pushing this for a while, and, and I appreciate it. And uh, because what could happen here, you know, and it's it's an important thing. You know, we have people close to us that we've all known that it's happened to, and it's uh, yeah, it's don't just make assumptions and think you know, or just push them to the side. Well, they're they're messed up. They don't know, you know, whatever. It could be something small. It might just take a word. You Encouragement. And, mm -hmm. you know, we could all, you know, you never know who's close to that, you know, that's here with you and that they might be close to that point. You know, so it's. Same line, listen. Listen. And maybe if you're just there and just listening, what comes to mind is maybe somebody who's lost a child and they're like, if there's a God, how in the world could they take my baby from me and this, whatever? They're just so angry. Other things, somebody could go away out of anger and they just need somebody to listen to them, let them bend it out. And if you just listen, stay with them and don't run away, then the Holy Spirit can work through you to bring them back or open their eyes again or, or, or heal them or whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. But just listening. I think that's a, an with excellent, a lot of patience. An excellent and powerful word, Tim. Thank you. Uh, that was one of the things that came to my mind. We rarely ever listen. And when somebody drifts, we might listen, then we want to fix the problem. Um, several years ago, I used to be the building super at a battered women's shelter, and for whatever bizarre reason, everybody found out I was a seminary student, and even though we had professional, licensed, certified, trained counselors, the, my coworkers would come to me for counseling. And I had two liberal arts degrees and was working on an MDiv. I didn't have a clue how to counsel people, but I, get, I discovered very quickly they wanted me just to listen. They didn't want me to fix the problems. They wanted to be heard. It's amazing how powerful it is when somebody sits down with you and says, tell me, I want to hear, and care, and be patient. I think that was a good uh, word also that uh, the tenant had as well, that it's not just listening, it's listening patiently, because we don't know how long it's going to take for whoever to ultimately get to the point of what's really going on in that individual's life. I think, you know, being silent around someone, because a lot of people are, I mean, that's not what you ultimately want to do, but I uh, think a lot of people are suspicious as to, they know you, you're a Christian, they're suspicious as to why you're listening to 
you know, so if you're kind of quiet and like the, just listen to them, uh, like they'll open up to you. Hopefully, if not, they know you're a Christian and they're appreciative of you too. I know. I just think people might, oh, he's just coming over here to get me back into church and all that or whatever. Being quiet. The ulterior motive should be the person, not getting them back in Sunday school and getting them back in, a, in this or any congregation, but the individual themselves. What else? I, and I'm not going for anything in particular, but anything else that we might do in regard to those who drift. Anyone online might have something. <clears throat> like maybe a social worker who's out there <laughs> at home. That I'm married to. She might be fun. No me. pressure. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> I can hear your wheel spinning even from here. Well, I mean, the thing that I thought of was just um, praying for people and maintaining that relationship. You know, not condemning them or, you know, like has been already been said, listening, listening to their struggles, praying for them, praying that God would intervene in their situation. And, um, you know, I don't have anything else dramatic. I think that was a, an excellent point. That was one that I also thought of. Maintain the relationship. Not maintain the relationship in, in order to get them to come back to church. Maintain the relationship because you care about that person, you're friends with that person, you love that person, and you want to maintain the relationship. And then, like Tim said, let the Holy Spirit take over. Let God do in that person's life whatever God wants to do. Our point is to listen, to reach out to them, to disciple them. Uh, and discipling just means teaching. And sometimes teaching means listening. Uh, but maintain that relationship. Pray for them. And minister to them. Ministering to them doesn't mean uh, you have a little personal Bible study, you do anything kind of, and I know this is probably too theological of a term, too churchy. Minister to them however you can to demonstrate and to show that love, that the actions of love. I think maintaining the relationship is an excellent point. Anything else that we might do for those who drift? I didn't want to cut anybody off. I think maybe, of course, not ultimately wanting to decide you to drift with them sometimes. You know, like, but you're not, don't sacrifice what you know to drift, drift. So you follow their drift and kind of get to know them that way. Get to know them and what they are sort of involving themselves in without it being something you shouldn't be involved with. I think knowing limits is important. I think some of those interesting people were people who were totally unchurched about that rejoicing and went to love to them. You know, I mean, I think because all the people I know that go to church are really funny people. You know, they're really fun to be around, but they don't want to be influenced by that and become partakers of it. But it's fun, that kind of the rough person is actually pretty fun to be around sometimes. Know who they are and understand yeah. who they are yeah. and where they're at. Um, Dr. Spivey is beginning a series on apologetics. I took an apologetics doctoral seminar from him, and one of the points that he made at the beginning of that was that we're going to try and understand what people outside the church are thinking and feeling and what they're doing in order to be able to respond to that. Um, and it was interesting, one of the doctoral students said, uh, he brought up this uh, example of those who work for the United States Treasury Department who deal with counterfeit. Uh, currency. They are trained to know one thing and one thing only, what the real currency looks like. They have it memorized. They glance at a dollar, ten dollar, twenty, fifty, hundred dollar bill and know instantly whether it's counterfeit or not because they know the authentic um, currency. And his point, the student's point was, we should only be submerging ourselves in scripture and Christian theology. We shouldn't be experiencing what's going on out in the world. And Dr. Spivey completely disagreed, kindly but firmly, and said, we're going to learn and understand what other people are thinking, what others are feeling, what their journey is, so that we understand them. That's a way of maintaining relationship without necessarily giving in to whatever it is that they're experiencing, but also be able to be better prepared to respond 
to what they're experiencing. Rather than somebody saying, well, I'm having this non-Christian experience, and we shrug our shoulders and say, I don't have a clue what you're going through, but you need to be in church. That's not going to help. That's not going to save the day. But listening, maintaining the relationship, genuinely being somebody's friend, without the ulterior motive of getting them back into church, but simply being their friend to be their friend, and to care about them and to love them, understand the journey that they're going on, letting them be angry, and let God take care of the rest. Because that part is God's business. That's why I think those two questions that we have a tendency to ask of this passage are really questions that we can get an ultimate answer about. We can ask them, we can discuss them. But the questions of can we leave the faith, and if you do, can you come back? It's not really the, the point of this passage. I think the ultimate point is press on. And those who aren't pressing on, we need to reach out to them and to try and encourage them to press on. However that is, it is often very difficult to broach the conversation and maintain the relationship. But the rest we need to leave up to God. I, I know that's sort of a Sunday school answer, but we're in Sunday school. So sometimes the answer should be that simple. We do our part and we leave the rest up to God. That's an excellent plan. Uh, and I think it's one that we can stick to. It's not our job to convert people. It's not our job to reconvert people. It's not our job ultimately to be responsible for getting them back in, even if it might be our responsibility that they may have drifted. It's our responsibility to care about people and love them and maintain those relationships with them and leave the rest up to God. He has the harder job than we do. Let me go ahead and close this with prayer. Father, we are thankful for this word, though it is a difficult word, and it's not always easy to understand, and it has created a lot of problems. Ultimately, what we can see from this is to press on, to remain fully committed to you. And for those who are not fully committed to you, those that may be lingering, drifting on the edge, compel us, convict us to reach out to them in love, the same love that we have experienced that you have reached out to us and to care about those individuals. And also to remember, as the author of Hebrews has noted, that you pay attention to the works that we perform among believers, that we should continue to maintain the relationship with those who have not drifted and fallen away, to build up the body, to edify the community of Christ. Be with us as we enter into a time of worship, that we would continue to hear your word as it is sung, as it is spoken, as it is expounded upon that we would grow closer to you, that we would grow closer to each other, that we would maintain those important relationships as we listen to you and listen to others. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for those of you online. Thanks, John.